old body type down in sugar city She says she could fatty, really fatty haddy And there's no one a fella could really stop she She said that from since she's small, she fatty with one and all No one have the rights to make she stay home Saturday night Cause Saturday night fever, always on she mind Saturday night fever, jamming all the time Good evening to everyone Certainly a great joy and a privilege to see so many of you here tonight celebrating with us our 21st Independence Anniversary Celebration. This has become an annual thing for us. Every year we're here and you have been so faithful in following us for all these years. To assist us tonight as mistress of ceremony, is um, Denise Nicholas from the Antigua Association and Mr. Godwin Carty from the Anguilla Association. Would you please put your hands together as we welcome them to the stage as our master and mistress of ceremony. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I am, as she says, Denise Nicholas. I am representing the Antigua and Barbuda Association. My assistant this evening will be Mr. Godwin Carty from Anguilla. Now we're going to have the introduction of the flag of America, Florida, and St. Kitts and Nevis. instrumental version. 
So a moment of silence and then we will play the vocal version. sitting there and I was reflecting on our great country and I said you know there's one little uh, special thing that I wanted to mention because I'm such a sports fan and I remember this uh, young man by the name of Kim Collins our bright star from St. Kitts who was a five-time uh, Olympic champion over in, uh, in five different Olympics from 1990, 1996 to 2016. How many of you knew that? Come on, you got to know your history, man. You got to, he's here? Oh, okay, come on. <laughs> it is great to be here. Let us prepare our hearts before the Lord. Eternal and gracious God, there is no greater feeling of liberty than to experience freedom from sin and death that you have provided for us through Jesus Christ. Today our hearts and souls are free to praise you in celebration of our beautiful and dear homeland, St. Kitts and Nevis, and for that we are truly thankful. Lord, it was your humble servant David that said, 
Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. Eternal Father, as we gather today with a oneness as your son demonstrated in you before going to the cross, we ask that you will gather our hearts and minds with that same oneness as we strive with a high sense of patriotism to uplift and support the great dual island of nation of St. Kitts and Nevis, to shine as a beacon among other neighboring islands of the Caribbean, as well as this great nation in which we stand, the United States of America. We also ask your blessing upon this great organization by whom we are gathered here today in your name. We pray for your infinite wisdom and your divine instruction and guidance over those who you have appointed as overseers. Bless them, O oh Heavenly Father, and may your favor abide in them and their efforts as they seek to be of service for your kingdom. We moreover ask you, will grant that we will highly resolve on this great day to dedicate ourselves anew to the task of ushering in an era when goodwill shall live in the hearts of a free people. Justice shall be the light to guide their feet, and peace shall be the goal of humankind. To the glory of thy holy name, and the good of St. Kitts and Nevis, and all mankind, amen. At this moment, we would introduce to our president, Mr. Austin Paint. He's been president of SNAP. Uh, how many years? He's been the longest running president of SNAP. So, Mr. Austin, come forward. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are happy to have you here. But before we do anything, I'm going to ask you to stand again, and we are going to do a moment of silence for the victims of Hurricane Doria. Please stand. Once again, I want to join with um, our Vice President, Dr. Shirley Glassford, for welcoming you here tonight, and our 36 years of independence, and that's not celebrate 22 years of existence. We are one of the longest serving West Indian Caribbean Association in South Florida, and I want to give you a round of applause for keeping us going and afloat. The, the speech is written in the book, so I'm not going to go over it. I'm going to um, give away most of my time to a keynote speaker, Ambassador um, Everson Hall, because I know he has a lot to tell you and to bring you up to date from the Federation of St. Kitts Nevis and our diaspora. The reason why I ask you to do the moment of silence for the hurricane victims is this. If you don't leave with nothing else tonight, just pay attention to what just happened in the islands of Bahamas. And that alone should tell you that the great need that they have, how important it is, we as a Caribbean community, to stay together and keep organizations like ours afloat so that when it's your time, we have someone to lean on. Thank you and good night. Well, we have to give God thanks and praise for what we see has happened in the Bahamas. We have to give him thanks and praise. Our next performance this evening is going to be by the Caribbean Dance Group. And I hope my family for this evening, Mr. Carty, will come next. my husband for the night. 
We're gonna have the Carousel Dance Group. You know wherever they go, according to them, they mash up the place. Here is the first performance. still kicking, 1990 still kicking, 36 years after doing better, and you can tell me you're going to be quiet tonight, this is independence, from slavery to doctors, nurses, attorneys, athletes, I'm going to stop man, so y'all ain't with me tonight. If you love Sinkis and Nevis, say yeah! Yeah! I'm a proud Kiki Vision, say yeah! 
Hey, they made a mistake. You know why they made a mistake? They said I'm from Angola. I was born in Angola before 1983. So we are kittish on two. <laughs> yes. Everybody all right? All right. How you all doing? Are you all hungry yet? Well, the food is coming. Anybody here who was at the first St. Kitts and Nevis bar? Anyone here? You all have great memories of that first bar? I mean, we had the, twice the space, three times the people. So, everybody here, we do this every year, so keep your friends, your relatives, your neighbors, everybody, and you know, let's try to pack this place like we used to back in the old days. I got some fun memories of uh, that first independence. When, when I walk into that reception room, I saw all these beautiful ladies. Some of them ladies, I've seen them before. They were unrecognizable when I saw them at the ball. They looked so nice. I, re I remember a particular lady came in at the reception. You know, I, 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 I had this little small plate with a few little knickknacks on it. I think I was down to a chicken wing. And she came in and she looked around and she said, what if it's a food that the muggy people? I said, look, these, these are hors d'oeuvres. You made courses inside. The lady said, hors d'oeuvres? I ain't come here to eat no dove. I said, it's dove, it's hors d'oeuvres. So, it didn't start off too good for her, but I, I saw her later in the night and she looked like she was doing very well. But right now, it's time to eat and I need to eat too and nobody brought me any food so I'm coming down. So during the uh, dinner, this screen back here, we're going to be running a tribute, well not, it's a tribute. But it's an interview that was done on ZAZ by, uh, I forget her name, Cheryl Ward. Uh, 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 it was an interview that was done to the late Kenrick Georges, who I would consider a national hero. I don't know if the country has done that yet. But when you get someone who is so prolific in music, he got to be a national hero. So if he isn't, I'm making him one tonight. So, in his own words, he's going to tell you tonight how he get to where he got to in music. So in the meantime, enjoy dinner. A pleasant good evening. We are so happy. I am so honored to have with me. Mr. Kenrick Georges, many persons would know him immediately as the writer, composer of our national anthem. He is a national hero. It's a pleasure to welcome you back home. It's good to be here. Okay. Um, you, you're down in, as, as I mentioned, you are you know, a national hero to many poor persons in St. Kitts. You're down in all, all, all history books as one of uh, all great songwriters, composers, uh, for upcoming mus musicians or youngsters who might want to emulate your career path, I mean, when could you tell us when did your interest in music began? When did it begin for you? Well, um, when did it actually begin? Is um, I don't know. From the time I knew myself, um, I was exposed to music mostly by my mother. She was an ex she sang really very beautifully, and um, that is what kept the house in calm. You know, it was turbulent times, and um, I had a toy piano. I remember, I was really very young, probably about three, mm -hmm. and um, she would play melodies for me on the piano. Mm -hmm. um, we had instruments that were um, accessible, like um, the harmonica and little things. There was a time when I was able to tune a bicycle wheel, tune the spokes on a bicycle wheel, mm -hmm. and make music. Um, we made, um, I made guitars, you know with um, sardine cans and a piece of wood, 
tune it, played songs that I heard on the radio. It became very prolific on the um, harmonica. You know, listening around, delving into the steel drum mm. until it was like around 12 years and um, doing really, you know, extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. And my name is Sam Fleming, you know, said to me, look, go up to the camp, speak to Val Morris, tell him I sent you and get an instrument. So I went and said to him, I said, Good afternoon, Miss, uh, good afternoon, Captain Morris. No, good afternoon, Mr. Morris. Um, Mr. Fleming sent me to you and said, Just give me an instrument to play. He said, Sonny boy, I mean, wh what do you want to play? I said, that one. He said, what is that? I said, that one. He said, he said that's too big for you. It was a baritone. Mm -hmm. I was 12, a little, a little man, you know, and um, he said, um, okay, hold it. And he asked me if I could understand what's on the board. I said, if you explain it, I would. He explained the scale. So that day I played two scales and he thought it was really very extraordinary. So he mm -hmm. put me by myself to study for like a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. By myself, not with the rest of the beginners class. And after about two weeks, he threw me in the band, the military band at 12. Mm -hmm. Sitting next to Ivan Cohen, a seasoned musician, awesome. You know, the best sound you would hear. And he was a really very strict disciplinarian. Mm -hmm. And I was like, like tucked next to him. So, you know, I mean, he was like, I couldn't mess up. You've had what, um, I think looking from the, the, the outside in, what would seem a very rewarding musical career. And you hear a lot of horror stories. I mean, even here, you hear nationals trying to make it outside, or even in St. Kitts, to have a uh, satisfying, whether financially, emotionally, spiritually, musical career. How difficult has it been for you? Tell us, you know, s some of the satisfying times, or one of the more satisfying times, apart from writing the National Anthem, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe one of the more, more difficult times that you've had? Well, actually, the, the, whole, the whole trip is um, like a roller coaster. It's, it's like everything else in life. You know, it, it, it could be, the, the rewards really come mostly when there are extreme lows. Um, but in order to make it in the open, um, in the world at large, mm -hmm. you got to have all the relative information. And I find that that is crucially, um, you know, the, the, the thing that is most crucially lacking, you know, around here. Um, we, we do not have the, 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 the best sources of information for um, even us. With, even with the, 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 the internet, the computer? Well, well you see... It, got, it has gotten better with that? Well, the, the, the thing is knowing what information to get, mm. how and where to get it, and how to apply it. Much of the time, without um, someone next to you helping you to understand that information, that is where most of the problem comes. And um, what happens is, if you don't get crucial information at the very beginning of your, I would say, your, 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 your adventure into music, mm -hmm. you know, you could be, develop a lot of bad habits. And that is where a lot of the danger comes. Now, for me, I was fortunate. Again, like I said, when I went to the military band, Ivan Cohen, mm -hmm. you know, he was like probably the, the most seasoned and accomplished musician in the band at that time, mm -hmm. apart from another guy named Paul Archibald and a few other guys. Mm -hmm. But I was sitting next to Ivan Cohen, mm -hmm. and he was a strict disciplinarian. Now, with all that, that was about 12 years old. Then there's Errol Maynard who I saw writing music. So from the time I started at 12, So you had I that discipline background, oh, oh, yeah, going, out, going out on your own. Yeah, I've always had that discipline, and, and that is it's a sort of, um, not to be too timid, hard, it's a real quality in young people. You know, I mean, I was miserable at, you know, you know I had a lot of problems along the <laughs> way. You're a problem child. <laughs> well, well, you know what, but anything I love, I delved into it, like, um, you know, fully, okay. right? So, um, one of the things I did was that somewhere around 16, I found a curriculum from Berklee School of Music. And I studied with that secretly for many years, right? So I actually got into a formal format mm -hmm. with pretty much nobody knowing, okay. you know? So, and um, you know, if I found myself with some money, I would sooner buy books than a pair of sneakers mm -hmm. or jeans or anything. Um, one, one, of the, one of the things that really helped me along too was um, Wall Bookstore, mm -hmm. Ryan Records, um, where uh, Miss Wall, the old lady, she 
died now, God bless her soul. Mm -hmm. I would go to them to the store. I didn't have money to buy records. But I would sit there and tell her, look, could you please play Rick Honey for me? Could you please play this for me? And she would always play until somebody come into the store to buy a record. She'll go deal with them and play it again. So one of the things I did at a very early age was expose myself to very many different genres and different styles of music. Because being born into a culture of um, Calypso and then we adopted reggae out of Jamaica, that could not be enough to get you on the path so you of to proper yourself. development. Yes, I had to. I had to. And um, the couple of motivating factors, I always wanted to make my mother proud. And I always wanted to be comfortable with myself regardless. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be comfortable with myself with whatever I do. Okay. So the Defense Force Band, then Grand Dash 2. What was that experience like? And how Grand Dash, was it? Well, you Grand were Dash 2, he's, he's a strange thing. There was a transition between them. And for but the those, those people who don't know what Grand Dash 2 is, is, is <laughs> you know, get one of that. the great bands yeah. um, in St. Kitts. But there was a church in between there. Oh, there was? Yes, the church was in between there. Oh, wow. And I remember we used to have um, an audience. Um, the church is full. And um, an audience would um, extend to the street every Sunday. And we used to have some wonderful time. You know, I mean, um, blazing the trumpet. But by that time, I was uh, familiar with uh, pretty much all the other instruments and started. Um, but did, did, so the, the trump, just to sidetrack a little bit, the trumpet is your first love? Is it? No. No? No, music. Okay. It doesn't matter. Music is, um, you know, whatever is there, whatever vehicle is there to express it. If it's, I sat with the baritone, I went into the tuba, I went into the French horn, I went into the cornet. Um, I did every instrument. By the time I was 13, I was actually working with the beginner's classes. Mm -hmm. In one year, I was working with the beginner's class in the military. So didn't it diminish your, your, your ability on either one? Of, I mean, no. you played all equally well? No, not necessarily. But what I brought to each instrument is um, a very good understanding of its contextual, um, the contextual component. Mm -hmm. I understand each instrument rather well, each family of instrument. That is why I am, quote unquote, an accomplished arranger. Okay. You know, I mean, I, I, I see music as an overall thing, and I could pretty much use any instrument to express what I want to project. Okay, so the, the, the Defense Force Band, the church, which made it a, a pretty easier transition into Grand Ash too. If you came from the Defense Force to Grand Ash, it might a little bit, you know, there seemed to be a smoother transition because, but, especially given how churches are these days, I mean, the music is not as and, solemn as it used to be. Well, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll tell you another thing. Captain Morris had a band of, um, a, a pop, popular band of his own, and I did that for a few months at 13. Okay. So I was playing in dance bands at 13 <laughs> after one year in the military band. So it's, it's a whole bunch of things. Where, but but, but, but the, 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 the important thing is that... Um, I spent time searching for mm -hmm. the proper information and looking for the right examples okay. upon which to build. Okay. Right. And I would say that it's a real quality because most of us need someone to take us along. I am self-motivated. Is that the way it works for you? I mean, you don't necessarily need people behind you to push you. No, you, you, you kind I, of I, no I, I, I really don't. Um, and you know, this, this comes from um, my early years, my teachings in school. Mm -hmm. Pasha school, so mm -hmm. to speak, Newton Junior School. I had probably some of the best teachers that God made. You know, teacher Tucker, Teacher Richardson, mm -hmm. Errol Maynard. And it's now the Tucker Ash. Clark Primary School, wow. named after her. Wow. So that it, says it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, it was a very strict discipline, and the stuff that we did in elementary school then, you know, would, would probably um, rival mm -hmm. um, college. Okay. You understand? And so, so you know, being self-motivated came from a, a good basic backbone for me very early years. Okay. And my mother as well. I guess, I guess what, we wanted, what I wanted to try to do is to get a little bit behind the, 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 you know, the, the public persona of Kenrick Georges, because oh. everybody knows the great musician, but to get inside your head to find out exactly what it is that motivates you, that brought you to the point where you wrote a, 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 a pretty good, a pretty good, one of the best. Um, obviously to have been the winner um, national anthem but we will take us back to 1983 when did you hear of the competition and you know what happened from uh, um, from then for you well 1983 
um, again, to do anything and to be at an accomplished level, you got you got to be prepared. Um, when there was a call for independence, uh, there was a political component, a political component, you know, and um, I wasn't too keen. Personally, I wasn't too keen. But you know what? I said, suppose something emerged that I'm uncomfortable with. I don't have an argument. I didn't participate. But I had already, during the course of the time, helped other people write this stuff. They tell me what they want. I would write. And All the songs that entered the competition? Yes, yes I did. So you were competing against yourself? That's fine. I have no problem <laughs> with that. No, you know, because, I mean, I understand one thing. I have mm -hmm. certain, um, some people call me a philosopher because I think about life. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I always figure is that um, to be successful in any competition, stick to the criteria, know the field, and be different. You would always win. I um, I have always had strong sentiments about my country. I love my country so much. And um, that has driven me and um, the, the coat of arms says country about self. I knew that concept since I was a kid. You understand? That came into being at the turn of independence. So I said to myself, I have to take part. I have to write something. If something emerged that is um, better than what I submit, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I would be happy with it. So it was the very last day of the competition. Two o'clock in the morning, I decided I'm going to do something. Two o'clock in the morning, and it's going to end on that day. So, no, no, no. I'm saying that the competition. Was oh, it was, it was due to end yeah. on that day. And I started two o'clock in the morning. I wrote the lyric, I wrote the music. By six o'clock, I was done. I got out of my house, went to Mrs. Gums on Greenland, mm -hmm. a piano teacher, and I said, Would you please play this for me? She, um, I don't know if she knew me. At what time? It was after seven. She was still doing breakfast. Seven in the morning? Yes. And this was the final day to submit. So I went to her and she played it. She said, this is, this is good. I said, okay, thank you very much. She played it, put it on a tape, and I submitted it the same day, the competition. Sometime after that, you know, I was um, alerted that I, um, they wanted to see me. The committee wanted to see me, mm -hmm. and they gave the information. It still didn't sink in. They give it that you had won at yeah. that point. Yeah, yeah. Because you know there's some preparation going on and mm -hmm. so on. And um, one of the amazing things was that um, some people chose not to believe that it was done in such short a time. But my convictions with respect to my country and sentiments, emotions are extremely deep, and it doesn't take um, a whole lot of preparation mm -hmm. to express how I feel. You know, um, so. That was it, and, and as far as I'm concerned, that has been my high point in, the, in my whole musical career. When, when, when people listen to the words, you know, oh, land of beauty, or oh, country where peace abound, I mean, what do you want them to be thinking about, St. Kitts? And, and, and <clears throat> those words, when, you, when you, you wrote them, do they still mean the same? Are they, are they, you know, has, has things changed to the extent where the words are not as uh, um, impactful as they would have been back then? Well, well they're still as potent now as they were then. It was a call for us to keep the country, or see the country for the best of what it was, mm -hmm. and maintain that as we go along. Um, it says, O land of beauty, our country, we are peace about thy children stand free. That was then, is now, and I'm hoping for it to continue, and the be. strength of will and love. I mean, the, 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 the bond between St. Kitts and Nevis, with all the confusion, mm -hmm. all the perceived confusion, mm -hmm. yeah. to me, that's superficial and of none effect. Okay. My grandmother, my great grandmother came from Nevis, my grandmother came from Nevis. Mm -hmm. I have the other side coming from Anguilla. So I mean, all I'm asking for is for the good that we see, the good that we know. Let it continue. Um, you know, I could go into every line yeah, and yeah, try yeah, to explain Yeah, I know you could. I but in, you could. In, in, in terms of um, the, the, the overall concept mm -hmm. was let's keep seeing it and Nevis as it is with respect to the best of what we have between us. Mm -hmm. How has winning that competition influenced what you did, um, what you've done 
since, since then in your, in your home? Has it, it, it has, it, it, it actually is a daily reminder that I do not have the privilege to do just what I feel anytime and anyhow. It's an obligation as a petition to represent? To represent at every level. And, uh, and um, I, I got to say saying, I got to say focus. And I cannot, after making such accomplishment, mm -hmm. bring any disgrace on my country. Okay. So it is a So it has, come, it has come with a certain amount of responsibility. Yeah, and it's, 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 um, it's enormous because sometimes, I mean, you are tempted to do things that would be um, instantaneously gratifying. Mm -hmm. And you're suddenly reminded, look, can't do that. Okay. Regardless, you know, can't do that. When you look back on, on what we've done, I mean, we're, we're 25 years of independence. What does, that, what does that mean? It means that we have charted much of our own course for 25 years. When you look at all the different dynamics, look at all the parameters, you can see we have achieved a great deal because there's a whole lot of growth, mm -hmm. you know, between then and now as far as infrastructure and a whole bunch of other things are concerned. But it has also mean that we have failed miserably mm -hmm. in some areas. And um, one... Which is, which is okay. Because, you know, there are going to be mistakes along the way. Well, I don't see such things as mistakes. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a personal concept. Mm -hmm. And I could very well be wrong. I'm not a philosopher like some people think. But I believe that when you're independent, one of the things you must do is mm -hmm. pay strict attention to your cultural development. Okay. Now, we have moved from a sugar economy mm -hmm. to tourism. Very fickle. But at the same time, it could be very rewarding if your cultural, um, the cultural aspect of your society has grown to the point where it can actually represent within the, the confines of the hotel industry. Mm -hmm. Because there's a whole lot saying it has to offer as far as human resources are concerned. Oh, yeah. And culturally, we could be on top of the world. Now, I was never concerned about academics and um, a direction of science and mm -hmm. math with respect to this country. Human resource development of the United Nations have determined for many years we're like 98% literate. Wherever you go, I've been to Japan, mm -hmm. Kitchens that they are doing well. I've been all <laughs> over the world yeah. traveling as a musician. Yeah. Kitishans are there doing well. We are at the top of our game academically. We just now need to focus intensely on developing our culture, culture. and our arts. I mean, like, I'm also an artist. Mm -hmm. I'm also oh, an yeah? artist. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm concerned about every aspect mm -hmm. of art. Every aspect of art because there's room for everyone. You understand? And the thing is, it's a small place okay. with a powerful, um, I would say, maybe too much brain power. But, you know, we have always managed to migrate. But when you migrate, you migrate with something. You understand? Because you don't necessarily want to start from scratch someplace else. Okay. So you want to move from base with something to develop on. Okay. Did you, did you, did you ever go on to have formal education in, in, in music? Were you ever... <laughs> Why'd you laugh? No, it's, it's funny because um, I did, I did, I did once. Because it came so natural to you, you know, well, you don't yes. necessarily always need that formal. Well, here's, 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 here's a catch. Um, again, I found a curriculum for Berkeley School of Music, right. music program, you mentioned that. that I l delved into from about the age of 16. Mm -hmm. So it was a sneak. I went to Jamaica in 79 on... Um, a diploma, a diploma for a diploma um, program. Mm -hmm. When I got there, I mean, I was scared to death. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I wasn't aware of where I was at, you know, I mean, as far as having the formal elements down, because I was never tested. And I was scared to death, but I thought I was prepared. Um, got to Jamaica, went, did my classification exam, which was supposed to be like for, I think, was um, two hours. I did it in 30 minutes. Um, they looked at it. I didn't do too well. I only got like 96 points, 98 points. 98 out of what? 100. <laughs> okay. No, the, the mistake oh. I made was 
I thought it's a fifth. And I just, you know, I mean, you know, inverted. Mm -hmm. You know, musically, a fourth is also a fifth. If you flip it. So, do you, do you put that much that much pressure on yourself to always? No pressure. No pressure. I just do what I have to do. Mm -hmm. You know, with um, you know the the the, the, um, the 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 proper thoughts in mind. There was no pressure. I mean, I had um, two hours of it in about thirty minutes. So the the the, um, the mother said, "Are you really done?" I said, "I think so." Mm -hmm. She went and looked at it. I said, go down into the room with this man. I went and I did some work with a man named Aubrey Adams to put me in the AA division. And um, when they realized what I was actually doing, it was rather amazing to them. No, you know, you've completely contradicted what this interview is all about because what? we're trying to, to show um, Kenrick Georges as an ordinary man, but you, you're extraordinary. What well, your skills and your... Your brain power. Uh, again, I, I would accredit that to my early years, my teachers, you know, I mean, and the desire to make sure that I've, I would never do anything to disgrace my mother. Okay. My mother more so than anybody else. Okay. Well, and of how, course, how myself. did she feel when she heard you were, you, you had won the national oh anthem? Oh my God. She actually intercepted my, 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 my first real opportunity. I was supposed to go to Europe. Um, to Brussels to work for a radio and television company to do music production. Mm -hmm. She asked me to stay. In and uh, to stay for independence. I said, Mom, it is not going to turn out well for me. It's my first opportunity. I can't afford to lose it. Mm -hmm. She said, Kenrick, you're the first in the family to achieve such, you know, to make such achievement. Mm -hmm. Please. I said, Mom, you come. You accept the award. I said, Mom. She said, no, Kenrick. I said, okay, Mom, you know what? Have it. I didn't go, but at the same time, everything came to from the musicians' union, the authorization, and everything. Lost the contract. I stayed for independence. Was it worth it? It was worth it. Your mom was happy. Yes, yeah, she was. She was extremely <laughs> happy. She was extremely happy. But I think um, it could have been. It could have been um, a bad decision on my part because I mean I didn't prepare myself. Mm -hmm. um, it was um, an opportunity where I could have stepped up and done well, you know, in other areas. Mm -hmm. But, you know, do I regret it? I can't say. I, mm -hmm. have, I have regretted it because um, I take responsibility for whatever I do. I don't run away from anything. Mm -hmm. Everything you do have a consequence. And I just true. deal with it. So where are you now? What are you into musically? Um, right now, I'm in college. Okay. I'm pursuing a degree to teach at college level. Mm -hmm. um, I anticipate that I'll be through that in much shorter time than um, would than would not than would not with 99.5 percent, which which is pretty bad. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> well, actually, I mean, my, 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 so you're, my you're not playing at all. Um, not not for yourself, but you're not playing out, you know, with any band. Well, I have the bits and pieces, and. Um, I walk around sometimes, mm -hmm. but I have um, concentrated all my efforts to um, completing my program, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, you know, in, in terms of playing, I, I just don't want to be distracted at no count because it's not just music. I mean, it's a full college program, okay. you know, I've got my electives to do and, you know, a whole bunch of yeah, stuff. Yeah, all the college work. Yeah. And it's, it's not... Um, I would dare say at this point there has been no difficulty, there have been no real hurdles, but um, just total um, amazement from the institution's okay. standpoint. There's so been... you want to get into teaching? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 pretty much what, what I'm age? after. Hmm? What age? College. What a or oh, college at college hmm. level? Yeah. I'm I'm actually doing some of that right now. Do you do anything with the young people at all? Are you, have, you, have you ever done? Yeah, I've been. I was doing that in New York. I was doing that with, uh, with, with, with youths in New York. But, um, you know, right now, because of the situation, the, the climate and everything else, you know, you, you can't really get to where you want to go without a paper of qualification. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how good you are. And that, that, has, that has been um, my Achilles heel. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm, I'm doing something about okay. that now. Yeah. Um, I, I used to be a bit discouraged because you think that it's, it's late, but it really isn't. Okay. You can see it in the big picture, it really isn't that late. And uh, my, my teacher, my, my music professor, he's like amazed. Mm -hmm. You know, his first question to me after he almost shoot my head off in my first class, 
and then because of her, what chose to answer a question and then there was an Always incident. Always the, the, the wild child, the, the pleasant no, child no, he, coming he thought, in there every now and no, again. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm always a good kid. You could ask Miss Richardson. I mean, she's around. She would tell you. <laughs> but <laughs> you could ask Errol Maynard. He would tell you. <laughs> and he would tell the truth. <laughs> oh, yeah, he would tell the truth. But, you know, what, what happened is um, he asked a question, and he thought I'd answer the question too academically. Mm. And I understood where he was coming from only after, you know, and um, he said, look, I need to see after class. And after class, he said, what's your story? I said, uh, you sure you want to know? He said, yes, what's your story? I said, are you sure you want to know? He said, sir, don't be playing with me. What's your story? Uh, uh, I pulled uh, my uh, stuff white out. White guy, a black guy? Black guy, PhD, mm -hmm. awesome. He's an awesome person, awesome musician. He knows the whole thing about performing arts. Okay. But he himself did a lot of work um, in um, drama and all kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So first thing I do was tell him a little bit about myself and I gave him a portfolio with mm -hmm. some of my writing, some of my charts and so on. The first one he pulled was the national anthem. Then he said, so what are you doing here? What are you doing here? I said, I'm here to learn and to get myself qualified. He said, so what are you doing here? I said, sir, I'm here to learn and to get myself qualified. Look, I said, we've got to talk some more. I said, okay, fine. You know, I behave myself and so on and all that and all that and all that. <laughs> and, um, you know, he, he, he thought that I was um, very much ahead of the program that that mm -hmm. institution was offering. Mm -hmm. You know, but it, again, it was my first foot in the door with respect to um, an, uh, in, in the conference of an institution, yeah, yeah. context of an institution. You know, so, um, you know, the, 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 Every person in the faculty that came to, knew, came to know me mm -hmm. um, in psychology, in English, whatever it was, they all seemed so you're to be. Still, you're still I mean, representing? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I have to represent. I have to represent because, I mean, like, my, my, my responsibility is enormous. They ask you if they're any more like you in St. Kitts? Well, I told them they're quite a lot more like me, you know, but um, they, they, um, they couldn't quite see it. Mm -hmm. They couldn't quite see it. Henrik, it's been such a pleasure. It's been such a This is the first time you, have, you and I have ever sat down officially and, 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 mm -hmm. and had a conversation. And we really wanted to, as I said, show the, the, the viewers, you know, a look at Kenwick Lodges, the, the composer, mm -hmm. the musician, and get a little bit behind that very stone face. <laughs> it's not a stone <laughs> face. You know, you know what, 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 happened, what happened is... Um, I don't, I don't want to say the truth, but I'll just tell you a little bit of it. Um, I'm a very emotional person, mm -hmm. and um, this is just um, a deterrent okay. that works sometimes. Some okay. people see through it and then, you know, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really a cool guy. Well, we're happy I'm that really you, cool you, you were soft enough to come and speak with us. We really appreciate it, and, Thank you, you know, it was a pleasure Thank speaking you. with you. Yeah. And as I said, you are our, our, our one of our national heroes, and we really appreciate what you've done for us in terms of our national anthem, and what you continue to do for us in terms of representing St. Kitts. Well, you know, you, you know what, um, I really do appreciate um, the position or the situation I find myself in right now to be representing St. Kitts at um, such a level especially with respect to the music festivals, you know, because um, the public and um, everybody else involved seem to be very impressed with the work that I'm presenting, mm -hmm. you know, as, as is the case in most cases, like even while I was on the road with Arrow for many years, mm -hmm. every time he would introduce me, he would introduce mm -hmm. me as the author and composer of the national anthem of my country, and that would send the crowd up in smoke. Right. You know, it was always like that. So like I said, it's always a reminder. Okay. Thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate it again. I've been speaking with Kenwith Georges, the writer, as he said, composer of the National Anthem of St. Kitts and Davis. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. It's been a pleasure having him here with us. That's it. Good night. Good night. struggles, St. Kitts and the Nevis be our nation about 
and prosperity. Deeply committed to St. Kitts and Nevis, Ambassador Hall also served as a liaison between the incumbent NIA, Nevis Island Government, and the St. Kitts and Nevis Federal Representative to UNESCO and preservation planners at home and abroad. His extensive research on a wide range of economic issues includes over 60 publications and technical reports as well as regular contributions to the local St. Kitts and Nevis newspapers. Born in Nevis, Dr. Hall has three children, Lovell, Randy, and Cecilia. He is married to Dr. Sandra D. Cook Hall. I present to you Dr. Emerson Hall. Thank you very much, Ringo, for that wonderful introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure for me to be with you this evening as we celebrate the 36th year of our nation's political independence. At the outset, I should point out that the comments that I share with you this evening do not really necessarily reflect those of the government of St. Vincent Nevis. I am a former professor, so I tend to default on occasions like this to my training in economics. So you'll hear a lot of that this evening, and regrettably, some of it will involve, involve talk, but I hope that you will gain something from it. And to the outset, I would like to express my profound thanks to the president, Mr. Elvis Keynes, who extended the invitation, as well as the support staff who came together in making this evening's event possible. First, ladies and gentlemen, the economy of St. Kitts and Nevis is performing well. Several important performance indicators suggest that it is actually outperforming the members of its peer group. Notwithstanding, the country's performance remains far short of its full productive potential, and deliberate policy action should be considered if the country to, is to accelerate its thrust towards mitigating the harmful effects of those factors that stand in the way of achieving its mission objectives. Along the way, I will attempt to identify a few of the areas that have been harmful to us, as well as those that have lifted us up and are helping us to reach our full productive potential. Special emphasis in my presentation will be given to the importance of seeking to enhance the efficiency and productivity of the nation's human capital base, that is us, and the role that incentive-based compensation can play in helping us to achieve this end. By incentive-based compensa compensation, in short, I'm referring to what is known as pay for performance. That matters to me a great, great deal. How these issues are addressed will determine the future of the country and the welfare of our people. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as the smallest sovereign state in the Americas, the nation proudly stands at or close to the head of the regional class in a number of very important performance rankings. St. Kitts and Nevis has compiled a solid record of gains in economic activity and growth. Data compiled by the World Bank through 2016 reveals that this growth has been led by a strong household consumer sector. Ladies and gentlemen, that's you and me. Sustained growth in exports, that's very important, and net inflows of foreign direct investment and an appropriately modest increase in government expenditures, they have all played a very important role. But of special significance to the economy of St. Kitts and Nevis is what has become known as the Citizenship for Investment Program. A number of steps have been taken to strengthen the due diligence process, to minimize the security risks, and sustain the integrity of that program. And although the CDI program, the Citizenship by Investment Program, is facing stiff competition from the establishment of new programs that have emerged in Antigua and Bermuda, they have a very similar program there, 
Dominica and St. Lucia, notwithstanding, Sanfits and Denevis, under its CPI program, continues to perform well, generating significant benefits for the people of Sanfits and Denevis. And I should point out that that program, the Citizenship by Investment program, is the dominant factor that is driving the Sanfits and Denevis economy. Although there's some controversy about the use of per capita measures, and per capita I mean standardizing data by looking at the population size. Very often we need this like to brag about the importance of the number of test cricketers that we've produced on a per capita basis. Well, the way in which that is determined by taking the number of um, um, test cricket players that we've had and dividing it by the population size. And that computation matters if we're going to compare the performance of St. Vincent and Nevis with that of Argentina in the South, um, Brazil, further north, and Colombia and other large countries with, um, in the Western Hemisphere. Although there's controversy about the use of that measure, these standardized indicators that appropriately measure the population size, they are of critical importance in evaluating our performance. It is important that there are performance indicators in place that document where our small nation was 36 years ago, and when it, when, it was shed, when it shed its colonial past as a colony of Great Britain and became a fully independent foreign state. We need to have some way of comparing where we were then with where we are today and where we are likely to go into the future. In 1983, the, when independence was um, established, the per capita income of St. Kitts and Nevis was actually below that of most member states of the Organization of American States. So that's the group that I work with. It's 34 members. It begins in Argentina in the south. You go up to Brazil, all of the countries of South America, all of the countries of Colombia, the Latin, all of the countries of Central America, the Caribbean region, and it begins all the way up in the, um, the north with Alaska being part of the US. All of Canada is a member, all of the USA is a member, so there are 34 of us all together, and I happen to represent St. Kitts and Nevis among that group. On this or the 36th year of independence, I take enormous personal pride in reporting that setting aside the United States of America and Canada, which are absolutely not a member of our peer group because of their large size, the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis stands close to the head of the per capita income performance class among the OAS member states, that's 34 member states. Data reported by the World Bank for 2017 Data reported by the World Bank, thanks for your acknowledgement of this, because for me personally, that is very, very important. You've got to remain at the head of the class. Okay. Data reported by the World Bank for 2017 indicates that only the Bahamas and oil-rich Trinidad and Tobago have actually outperformed St. Kitts and Nevis on a per capita basis. What I'm saying is that we're ahead of Brazil, we're ahead of Argentina, we're ahead of Colombia and all of those countries that are in the Western Hemisphere. And only those two countries, the Bahamas, which has just been had hit, and Trinidad and Tobago because it's oil rich, they're the only two countries that have a higher per capita income in the Western Hemisphere than St. Kitts and Nevis does. <laughs> to illustrate, if we go back to pre-independence, that's back to 1977, St. Kitts and Nevis actually had a lower annual per capita income than Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, and Jamaica. We were all lower than them back in um, the pre-independence days. That's not the situation today. We're way above all of them. Its per capita income level at that time, that is back in 1977, was a meager $1,017. Looks like peanuts to us today. That was only moderately higher than that of China, India, and Gu Guyana. Now, over the following 41 years, St. Kitts and Nevis has progressively outperformed each of these countries, and in 2017, outperformed Barbados. Barbados used to be ahead of us, but in fact, we've surpassed Barbados now, and certainly Jamaica has not been doing very well. Their per capita income is at $9,200, and it turns out that ours in St. Kitts and Nevis is at $28,200, which is three times the size of Jamaica's economy. What we do observe also that 
economic agents or individuals, we move around in terms of better alternative opportunities. Alexander Hamilton left Nevis, he was born in Nevis, he left there 200 years ago, but he moved around, he went off to St. Croix and then on to New York, attending Columbia University, in large measure because of that quest for alternative opportunities. The folks that you see from Jamaica in St. Croix and Nevis are indeed doing the same thing. They're moving around in search of better alternative opportunities, and naturally in the Olympics. When we had the exodus coming out of St. Croix and Nevis in the 50s, going on to, um, to England, they moved for the same reason. Our performance is ranked third in the entire CARICOM region. Of course, as I mentioned before, the Bahamas has a per capita income of 32,400. Ours, of course, is at 28,000. And Trinidad and Tobago is slightly less than um, the Bahamas, which is at 31,300. That is the income per person of the country. Notwithstanding these laudable accomplishments, they do not provide a sufficient basis for us to sit back and rest on our laurels. And I'll tell you why. This, there is much for us to aspire to in pursuit of the nation's full productive potential. There is, of course, out there an independent state called Singapore, which is 12 square miles smaller than Dominica. While our per capita income is 28,000, you won't guess, but the per capita income of Singapore is $99,000. So in other words, we're doing well, but there's a long way that we have to go. Consider our neighbor that is closer by, Bermuda, which is roughly half the size of St. Vincent Nevis. Some of you may or may not know this, but there's a huge segment of, and I mentioned this to some of our colleagues here earlier this evening, but there's a large group that left St. Vincent Nevis to work on the neighbor dockyard in Bermuda. Those persons, that was back about 200 years ago, their descendants have now moved into higher income occupations in Bermuda and they're doing extraordinarily well. And what I urge the group to do is to try to establish a link between St. Kitts and Nevis and Bermuda. We, we have now an honorary council located in our from Bermuda that serves St. Kitts and Nevis. It's very important that that group in that small island of Bermuda, which is half the size of Nevis, that they have a group that is exactly like this. If you extended an invitation to the Bermudians, they'd pack this off because they're small and they try to get out of Bermuda as fast as they could. But it turns out that Bermuda has a per capita income that is even higher than that of Singapore. It is $99,410. Ours is $28,000. That's why we need to see Bermudians come into circuits, investing in our properties, and helping us to develop our economies. It's very important because they are a part of our community. They, many of their people have actually descended from, from St. Kitts and Nevis. The remarkable um, performance of St. Kitts and Nevis has not occurred by happenstance. This isn't by accident. It reflects the will and dogged determination of a people that have sought to foster a climate that seeks to motivate the flow of capital investment to our shores. It is also accompanied by very deliberate fiscal policies that have held the line on punitive taxes. We tend to reduce our VAT taxes. Many of the states in the region have not done that. And that is very important. That reduction in taxes means a few more dollars in your pocket, which allows you to go to the grocery store. So we don't punish people merely because they happen to be wealthy or doing well. In fact, I would urge us to have more persons of wealth because as you know, Robert Smith in uh, at Morehouse College, you know what he did, he's a billionaire. What did he do on graduation day? He made an announcement that he was going to write off the debt of all the students attending the college. And that is why the world needs more rich people, not less. <laughs> we shouldn't seek to punish them merely because they're rich, because guess what? They always have the option of giving it away, okay? And that's what we expect all of you here in this room to do as you move up the chain to give back some of your wealth to Seneca and Nevis. Achieving our highest productive potential goes beyond uttering nice sounding words. It requires that each must seek to perform at an optimal performance level. And that means essentially that we should try to be the best that we can be at whatever we do. This mission objective was emphasized quite persuasively earlier this week by the Honorable Deputy Minister, Prime Minister Sean Richards in address to the students and faculty at the beginning of the school year. He emphasized the importance of being the best that we can be in all of our pursuits. I was so moved by his message 
that I sent him a post personal note thanking him for issuing the call. We are living in a highly competitive world. Each one of our 14 CARICOM member states is richly endowed with pristine blue waters, refreshing tropical breezes, and brilliant sunshine. Bringing into market questionable products that will not be accepted for long by a highly discriminating public that has to come that has come to expect first rate services. So this is essentially the message that um, the Honourable Sean Richards is making, because he's saying in whatever we do, we should seek to be the best that we can possibly be. If we're offering services, if we're doing landscaping, it doesn't matter what we're doing. We've got to be the best in class because we are selling the identical product that every other country in this Caribbean region is selling. Pristine blue waters, blue skies, we've got to have something more to bring to the table. And that means we've got to simply just outperform them on simply to mean that's the best that we can possibly be. On the positive side, our nation has demonstrated the will to rein itself in and live within its means. That's also very important. The heavy burden of cumulative outstanding public debt, which imposed a severe drag on the economy of St. Vincent has been reduced from an unconscionably high rate of 186% of GDP. And there was a time, ladies and gentlemen, we were one of the most highly indebted countries in the world. And that is not the case anymore. We're moving in the right direction. By 2010, that rate is the 186% of total GDP, declining to 145%. Moving in the right direction, bringing it down. This is your credit card, you're, you're really bringing it in. The IMF projects that the nation's debt burden, that's a heavy load that we're carrying in debt. That's what you're carrying on your credit card. You're trucking that high load around, and it's costing you a lot. The IMF indicated that this, uh, in 2018, that ratio would come down to 60% of GDP. A remarkable progress from where it was um, back in 1986, or 19, 2002. And this is an outstanding achievement, ladies and gentlemen. The protracted interval of massive current account deficits, each year you're running up a lot of red ink, which used to be like $50 million, $50 um, million each year, and attended cumulative public debt, and that debt stood in the way of more progress and expansion. The mandatory financing of the interest payments. Keep in mind that whenever you have debt, you've got to pay interest payments. Those of us who have had those credit cards, many of you are probably facing those 25% interest rates. We should, be, we should run away from them as fast as we can and try to get them down to a manageable rate. Because you'll spend your the rest of your life trying to pay them off. The mandatory financing of the interest payments and servicing the public debt soaked up revenues that were critically needed for meeting the full array of basic human needs. In other words, you're just paying off this paper that you borrowed and it's getting in the way of other things that you need to be doing, like providing education, providing roads and other things like that. So ridding the nation of its heavy debt burden frees up the nation for expanding on several um, fronts. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, while I've said that, I should also point out to areas where we're having some difficulty. On the negative side, our nation has an import problem of what I consider to be of gargantuan proportions. It's that big. It turns out that the single biggest factor that is actually holding us back is the expenditures that we're making on imports of foreign goods. It amounts to $1.5 billion in 2016. It's a negative number. It drags you down. It's money flowing out of the country rather than money coming in. Now these negative imports, um, they're breaking new records in each passing year. I monitor those numbers very carefully, and it's the only item in what we call the, the Keynesian trilogy, that's how we measure the economy. It's the only negative number. It's going this way, everything else that we have is going north, as it should. We have one thing that's holding us down, that, that, that's a negative number. And it accounts for roughly 60% of the nation's gross domestic product that's just going out of the country. The lion's share of these, import, of these expenditures is for manufactured imports, which account for 76% of all imports. There are no easy answers, I should admit, because our food, food import bill is high, but so too are our imports of pharmaceutical products, electronic data processing, 
automobiles and transportation equipment. Now, we may not have substantial control over the level of imports of manufactured products. We can't do much about that. We gotta have the cars coming in. But we can do something about the level of expenditures on food imports. We really shouldn't be bringing that stuff in from Colombia, you know, and putting it on our grocery shelves, when in fact, it's talking to some folks around here, they said, virtually anything that you put in the ground here in Orlando or Miami, it comes right up in, in terms of highly productive food. I can't remember which gentleman mentioned that to me, but I think it's a distinguished gentleman over here. He pointed to talking about, about his garden. Well, we've got fertile land and sea, and we really should be making, making, greater, making greater use of that. Because if we do, it reduces the level of money that is flowing out of the country because you're producing these goods at home. The income will be kept at home, and that's very, very important. Now, as noted earlier, Senkits and Nevis has performed well above its peers. Concerned about the is this issue of incentive-based compensation, which I think the, the, interest of the speaker mentioned, that issue happens to be very important. I want to spend a brief moment on that to tell you essentially how it in fact works and why to me it's very important in introducing a measure like this and moving this economy of Senkits and Nevis forward. Concerned about the issue, the government has given consideration to putting in place an incentive-based compensation plan. It hasn't decided yet in terms of doing it, but it's giving it very, very serious thought. In the words of our Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Timothy Harris, and I quote him, our quality of life is good, yet there are areas where, which require improvement. We must do more in the quest of excellence. That's what Sean Harris mentioned. Uh, um, uh, Minister uh, Richards mentioned. Our labor productivity, that's the output per person, each one of us, must improve. We must do more in less time. That is being more productive. You're spending less time on the job, but you're working harder in terms of generating and expanding your level of output. That's very important. That's what we call efficiency. We must do more with less. Many of you in this audience are presently working under an incentive-based compensation plan, especially those of you in the private sector. You probably already have this in place, so you're very familiar with it. It's concerned for their performance. We've got to be very much concerned about the ease of doing business. One person mentioned this today. I think it was Peggy over there, caught over there, which talked about some of the difficulties in doing business in Sengits and Nevis. That's not very good, ladies and gentlemen. We've got to find a way of clean up our act, cleaning up our act. And many of you, of course, have the experiences in terms of doing business in St. Kitts and Nevis. It's not always an easy thing, okay? We've got to get better at this and in terms of trying to um, improve, um, improve the way in which we handle those businesses. Now, under an incentive-driven compensation plan or PIP performance plan, every employee will have him before him or her every day that he shows up to work maybe about a, a card which has four items on it. And they are the goals and objectives that that person is called on to aspire to every day when he comes to work. It may have four defined, clearly defined goals. I've got to do this, that, and that. But if he performs those goals at the highest level, if the performance says that we should give him a bonus or reward, a cash reward, not just a thank you, nice thank you, you know, hand cash that he can take to the grocery store with, you know, that rewards him for his extraordinary effort. That's very, very important. The whole idea is that we want to motivate our people. If you want them to perform at their best, it's not simply sufficient to say, you know, come in each day and do the best that you can. You've got to pay them in terms of cash, beef up their basic pay, because what we have right now is a system in which every man and woman gets the, in the same pay band gets the identical pay. That is not good, ladies and gentlemen. It does not motivate work effort. If you know that you're going to get the same paycheck as the next guy, you'll just chill out every day. <laughs> get the same pay. So, the many of you in the audience are already working on such a plan, um, and you, of course, are very much concerned about the ease of doing business. Now, under an incentive-driven paper performance plan, um, I mentioned, of course, every employee will have four goals in front of them. Now, these visible cash awards that you will receive as a result of your outstanding performance, put differently, ladies and gentlemen, we're thinking about a most valuable claim. Whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in education, or whatever the field might be, we want to identify those most valuable players. We have to say the same system in cricket, okay? If you're the most valuable player, you're the guy who's gonna walk off with the car. 
Well, the first of all, the magazine does develop the best package of agricultural products that he can um, present to the grocery stores, or he can actually um, ship to the to the use, um, you know, for, uh, for the uh, consumer markets or whatever. He should be recognized and rewarded, you know, with a huge cash, cash bonus at the end of the performance period. I would go further. I would say declare a national holiday, allow this guy to drive in the back of an open car that's back, most valuable player, have him go around the entire island, have him stop at each village with lady, young ladies in pom poms waving, you know, signs of the car that says most valuable player going back. You're telling the world that this guy matters. He's a highly productive person, he's the best in class. That's what we I think is very, very important to do. And I think this would send a message to others in the pipeline who are actually just you're just chilling out every day, that in order for them to do what he's doing and earn what he's doing, he's going to have the big house on the hill. They too have got to step up their game and increase their performance. But that to me is efficiency, raising the output per man out. So what was once a well-entrenched practice in profit maximizing entities is now the same thing that I'm being describing right now. It's not something that's just come out of thin air. This practice is increasingly being adopted in a modified form among public sector organizations, such as the US government, the US Office of Personal Management, for which I worked. I worked on a system like this, so I know if any could agree with all these plans of structure. Um, it is not only in, um, in the US government that this exists, but it also is in the, 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 the Canadian federal government, has a paper performance plan in place. Clearly defined the pre-specified anticipated rewards, enhance an individual's self-worth to earn, uh, urge him to become a more productive person and for the organization to be much, be much more productive. These anticipated benefits may take various forms. They could include performance-based cash awards. I'm very big on, on, on cash because cash is what is recognized as PC. <laughs> Having a nice placard is all great to post on your wall, but it's more important to have cash in your hands. If you can't use it, you can always give it away, okay? That's very important to see. So I'm very big on having um, individuals earning more rather than less because you have, you have a couple of choices when you, um, get, you get, when you get paid. You can either consume your money, go to the grocery store and spend it. You can either save it. If you save it, somebody's going to come in and borrow it. Uh, but you can also give it away if you've got too much and don't know what to do with it. This, this person. And I'm urging those folks over here who have surplus income, there's the folks back home who actually need it back there in Kayon and Diet Bay. Give it away, okay? And you will get far more benefit from doing so than giving it to Uncle Sam for him to use it on fighting the next war because the benefits then will accrue to you. You will get the, the psychic pleasure of knowing back to your giving to the country that you love dearly rather than giving it to Uncle Sam for him to bomb the stuffing out of somewhere. Okay? Now, we have in place something called, or something that's being developed, it's called a diaspora policy. They held their first meeting last year, and that last year, and that to me was very important. What that policy effectively does is an attempt to rein in our people who are dispersed, widely dispersed, they're in London, and they're in Canada, they're in Washington, DC, and in Toronto, and the Virgin Islands as well. They are an important part of our labor force. One of the things that's happening is that countries are recognizing that their small states such as Sengis and Nevis, they have a land mass that expands beyond the water's edge. And a lot of the infrastructure is being planned for actually building these commercial establishments offshore. What was formerly just water is now being used. So in other words, we have outside of our region, land space, where it's now covered with water that much, much of it can be utilized. The analogous situation that I'm referring to here with respect to individuals is to recognize that we've got a whole bunch of folks, highly trained, and many of them at the mid-management level, many of them have been involved for 30 or 40 years. We've got to get them involved in the development of Seneca and Nevis, and that's what the diaspora policy is involved. Well, they're not going to leave New York, where they're earning 70 or 80,000 or $100,000 a year, to come to Seneca to work for 28,000 dollars a year. Therefore, we've got to, uh, we can't uh, close the gap overnight either, but we've got to meet them halfway. Okay, and that's my incentive-based compensation comes in. 
if you tell them that if you were to come down to St. Gitts and you perform at the highest level, you bring back some of these skills that you've acquired abroad, then we're going to recognize you and reward you for your outstanding achievements. That is a small step in terms of closing this gap, bridging the gap that exists. We've got to find a way of getting them involved, okay? These guys are very excited. They don't want to be in New York necessarily, okay? <laughs> they would very much like to, I mean, they, as long as they can contribute something to, to, um, to the folks at home, and that happens to matter to, to most of us. Because we value where we came from a great, great deal. When you make those trips back, you traverse the same roads that you did as a kid going along. You get great excitement in just driving by these places that you grew up. You know, you really have a, you, you're here, yes, but you really want to give something back. And that's what the diaspora policy is intended to achieve. This human capital base, its assets, they're located in London. There are quite a few of them in London. Many of them actually came down to the diaspora policy. Toronto, Miami, Washington, D.C., and the Virgin Islands. We need to find creative ways of bringing them back. Now, I'm going I'm to mention just one other um, item, and that is some, uh, some concerns that we have about a correspondent banking um, problem that we have. Now, a correspondent bank is one where if you were to send money down to one of your relatives and send it for you, just buy a check, you might typically, if you need to get it done in a hurry, you will bank wire some funds to that will go to the Sengis Nevis National Bank or the Bank of Nevis. But those funds typically have to go through what's called a correspondent bank in New York, whatever that bank might be. So it leaves you um, Miami, it will go up to New York, and then it goes down to um, St. Kitts and Nevis. Okay, well that bank in New York is called a correspondent bank. Um, well, it turns out that those banks have been very much concerned about something called money laundering. As a result of that, they have raised the prices that would <laughs> for offering their services to correspondent bank. And in some ways, they've actually cut out their services completely. Well, that presents a real problem for us because we're trying to get your money down to your relative back in K on and get there to, um, you know, to, uh, to um, have to deal with a sick person that is there. And then what used to be an overnight transaction by, by bank wire is now, could now take as long as three months. Wow. That's how long it's been taken. I know that I personally have tried to send money down for kids at Christmas, you know, to the Nevis Historical um, Society. And I sent it down in early December with the hope that it would be dispersed by the end of the year. It was three months, way into March, before the, 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 uh, the account was actually cleared by the Bank of Nevis. But that's the effect of not having a very effective correspondent banking service. So we have lost to that. What it means, therefore, is one alternative. I would have to go to the airport and maybe find a, a guy who's heading down to St. Kitts and Nevis and stuff a bundle of cash in his pocket. <laughs> well, there's no guarantee that it's going to reach the end to which it was intended. So that, that's the problem that it presents. So that problem continues, and the concern about money laundering is that we really don't have money laundering problems in St. Kitts and Nevis. The big capitals of the world where money laundering occurs is actually in London and in New York. We're a small domestic finance, um, country, uh, finance country where that is not really a problem. As I close, I'd like to go back, and I'm very thankful that um, the... Um, that um, our president actually drew attention to the situation in Bahamas, because of course that is very, very serious. It's a small um, island and low-lying coastal development state. Our security is intrinsically tied to our capacity to withstand the ravages of hurricanes and sea level rise in response to changes in climatic conditions. St. Kitts and Nevis is making important progress in transitioning away from petroleum products Significant progress has been made in Nevis in drilling for geothermal and ultimately commercialization of the highly valued clean energy forms. We are making some progress with respect to installing solar energy. You'll see those lights as you drive out to the peninsula. Um, you know, on the left-hand side as you go, you see those solar panels, and I think you see them at the airport when you go in. That's very important. And we're moving aggressively to, to rapidly bring in on stream re renewable energy forms in the form of wind, and I mentioned solar. In speaking with Ambassador Colley of the Bahamas on Tuesday of this week, he happens to be the representative for the Organization of American States where I serve, he indicated that the response so far in terms of providing relief to the people of, um, of the Bahamas has been quite good. We had on the other side of the table the, the, um, the ambassador for, for Dominica, who mentioned that in the case of Dominica, which was very hard, yet the sense of the recovery was coming on very nicely. So I was very encouraged to hear that folks have actually been responding very vigorously to rendering assistance. 
So what do you think you can offer, whether it is large or small, is very important, but thank you to me to be registered as one of the countries that actually contributed to helping to relieve the difficulties. Because of course, we all can remember what happened in Georgia's and some of the other hurricanes. We've been hit, but we're gonna be hit again, so that we're very, very vulnerable. So as I close, I would like for us to just keep this in mind, that it's very, it's very important that we give of ourselves to our country, and to remember the words of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, which are issued in his inaugural address of January 21, 1961. His immortal words for me are pregnant with meaning when he appealed to the nation to ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Let us give him another round of applause. I love the way he ended. Who remembered what he just said? Not what? Amen. Another round of applause. Now I'll have the president of the organization to come forward. Here with you again, ladies and gentlemen. I just wanted to come forward on behalf of our St. Kitts and Nevis Association of Florida and all of us who are here as friends and supporters to say thank you to our, our main speaker tonight, um, Dr. Emerson Hall, our ambassador to the Organization of American States. I met, I got acquainted with um, Dr. Hall for the actual diaspora conference. I was actually one of the presenter, and he, I considered him my trainer, my preparer. Like I spoke to him several times of how should I present and what should I do. And I realized the great knowledge and experience that he has. So we he can serve um, our federation as a real diplomat. So tonight I wanted to personally come up here and say thank you to him for preparing me when I did my presentation at the Dallas Power Conference last year in St. Kitts and Nevis, which was very important. And I'm glad he ended most of his message on that tone because we here have so much knowledge, not only in our professional life, but in our academic life, that we can come together as an association to serve our Twin Island Federation by giving back whether we remain here or we chose to go home. So I want to commend him tonight for being one of the persons that put the Diaspora Conference together because when I went there as a presenter, I also gained a lot of knowledge from the other presenters who came from England, the United States, Canada to make their presentation and tell us what they can do, and it also created for me a correspondence group where when we need help and assistance that we can reach out to, because so many people presented them what they can do and what they can help, and that's how I got acquainted with him. So I want to say to him, thank him, because once I sent the email, the unofficial letter, when he was um, suggested to be the keynote speaker, he responded within hours. And that's what we're supposed to do when our country calls upon us. So I want to challenge all of you tonight, based on his presentation, to join us as, associ as an association so that we can be bigger, stronger, and more together so in times of need we can give back to our Twin Island Federation. So once again, Dr. Hall, on behalf of our association, we want to thank you for a well-developed you know, speaker. Uh, message that you delivered tonight on behalf of um, our Twin Island Federation. Thank you. Excuse me for a moment. I just need to do the drawing for the picture, or as we will say, the picture, just in case any one of you want to go and get it. I'm going to do two drawings before you actually pay for it. 
So the little star that you have on your ticket, that's gonna be the number I'm gonna have someone draw. Call the number and if it's your number then you are you will get one picture compliment of snap. I'm gonna do four of them. Ticket number zero zero three seven thirty seven. Oh, wow! Ticket number zero zero seven eight. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give the ticket numbers to the photographer, the photographer, the picture taker, the guys out there with the cameras. When you're ready, go and see him. He's gonna give you one picture per ticket. Thank you for your time. Before you fall asleep again, we're gonna bring on some fish dancing. This time you need to participate. And the group that is coming out, the Caribbean dancers, this group is always involved in community development. And if you like dancing, speak to Mr. Wilson, and you can join the group. I, I promise you, you will enjoy yourself and lose weight and become very fit. They work very hard. So are you ready? Yes. This time, you saw it the first time. Let's bring them, let's let's clap them before they come on. Let's clap them on. Let's get them ready. For their final dance. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the Caribbean dancers as we do fish dance.
have to join that dance group. <laughs> Get your heart beat right. Ooh, good for that piece of cake I had a while ago. Um, Nikki is going to be going around with a bag. And they have two beautiful TV over there. Look, you can't even talk. Five dollars. Not from best, from brand smart, from best buy. That is quality. Two tickets, five dollars. Put your hands up if you want a ticket. Two tickets, five dollars. What? Just to raise money for the organization. Where you get 43 inch smart TV? You want to watch a ticket? You win two. You win a TV. Five dollars. Two fifty? That TV, when you go to sleep at night, you have to cover it with a white sheet because it has a camera that records everything. <laughs> so make sure you get your ticket. I'm going to call someone to pull a ticket. So we are here, um, we're raising funds for the scholarship fund. Every year, SNAP gives out money to young students with scholarships. So this TV is going to be for scholarships. So let's think about it this way. We're doing good for our young people. You know, so we're going we're gonna to do it. All right? We're going to do it for SNAP. So you ready? Here's what we're going to do. I'm popping the room in two. And we're gonna see which side is gonna raise the most money for SNAP. Okay? That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna raise money for SNAP. So we're gonna get this TV is gonna go to someone. So I'm gonna start on this side. Okay? We're gonna start realistically at ten dollars. When you go to the club, a drink costs ten dollars. Yeah, you know. So let's go. Anybody wanna buy this TV for ten dollars? Ten dollars, raise your hand. 
All right, that ten dollars right here. Ten dollars. Ten dollars. Fifteen dollars. Fifteen dollars. Let's do it. Fifteen dollars. Put your hands up. Huh? What happened to you guys? Oh, it's too low for you guys. All right, twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. Twenty-five dollars. Twenty-five. Twenty-five. I hear twenty-five over here. Somebody beat twenty-five. Forty dollars. Forty dollars. Come on, ring it out. You're raising money. Fifty dollars. Don't let me beat you. Come on, we're so quiet. Fifty dollars. Come higher. Let's go. Let's go. Sixty dollars. Sixty dollars. Forty. No, sixty dollars. Sixty dollars. Sixty dollars. Sixty dollars. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes. Seventy-five dollars. Woo! Seventy-five dollars. Seventy-six dollars. Seventy-six. Seventy-six. Eighty dollars. Eighty dollars. Come on, let's go. Let's snap it. Snap it. One hundred. One hundred. One hundred. Did I hit two hundred? No. Uh, one hundred. Let's go. One hundred. One hundred. One of four. One of four. One of four. Come on, let's do it. One ten. One ten. I love this. One ten. One ten on the west side. That's California. This is New York over here. One twenty for New York. Like one twenty. Let's go. One twenty. Going once. One twenty. Beat it. Towards education. Going towards education. One twenty. One twenty-five over here. One twenty-five. Come on, let's do it. One thirty. One thirty. I like it. One thirty. The pastor. One fifty. Yes. 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 Let's go. 150, 150, they hit 120, 180, 1 to 200, let's go. This is for our young students. You're doing this for our students. 175, woo, I love it, I love it. 175, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go, let's go, 175. Did I hit 180? 180? 200, oh, yes, 200, she said she got it now. 200, 200, 200, 200, 200 and 200 going once. 220, oh, 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 220 going over here, yeah, let's go, let's get it hot. Come on, West Side, somebody say something. Huh? 220 going once. Who's him? Patty, they call your name. They put you on the spot, no? <laughs> what you go? Say it. Act like a million years. Say it. <laughs> 220 going once. 220 going once and a half. 220 going twice. 221, yeah! Make it happen. 221. Somebody shut him down. Somebody shut him down. Raise your hand. Anybody else? 225. He, he be in business. He can have that TV tonight. 225. 225. 225 going one. 225 going one. Did you say, did you just say 300? Say yes, bro. Do look at the letter. Say yes. 300? Oh, no, no. 225. 225. 225 going once. 225 going once in a quarter. 225. 226. All right. 226. 226. Say that again. Call it out. 10. Now, yes, sir. 230. 230. I'm naming you the TV man. 2.30 for the TV man over here. 2.30. Who's going to be 2.30? 2.31. 2.31. <laughs> 2.31. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. 2.40. Yeah, we, we, well, we're doing good. We're doing good. 2.40. Can I get a 2.50? Let's make it 2.50 for our young people. Our young people, man. You know, we talk a lot when you do bad things. We need to do good things for our young people. Let's raise some money. So 2.41. 241. 241. Going once. 241. Going twice. Don't even get it for 241, man. Stick it for me. 241. 
for the three. All right, count down. Five, four, three, two, one. Two for the five. Okay, yeah. All right. Two for the five. Two for the five. Two for the five. Don't get a two for the five and I'll make it to two fifty now. TV man, two fifty. Two fifty for TV man. Two fifty. Anybody else? I wish somebody would just say 300 and call them Just say 300. They say, you know what? They ain't gonna come after you after you say 300. All right, going five, four, three, two, one. Oh! which is um, Marlon Jenkins. So the scholarship is now called the Marlon Jenkins Rudy Scholarship. Rudolph Marlon, there's another name. Rudolph Marlon A. Jenkins Scholarship. So it's no longer SNAP, I think it's maybe it's association. We wanted to honor our first president because he has left us and we miss him dearly, so we took the opportunity to rename the scholarship. So I want to reach out to all of you who participated in the bid and also the raffle to say thank you. Um, that money will be used to present our next scholarship next year. So on behalf of the association and our first president and his family, thank you very much for your contribution towards our scholarship fund. And here we go again, recognition. In the house, we have members from St. Lucia, where they are. St. Lucia, put your hands up. And they were early. <laughs> then we have, would you believe, we have St. Vincent in the house. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. We have Anguilla in the house. We have Classic Promotions in the house. That's a different island. We have Carib Isle Dance Group in the house. Beautiful performances tonight. We have our sister island from the Federation in the house, Nevis. Nevis Association. And then we have Mannix and the Antigua and Barbuda Association members in the house tonight. So on behalf of SNAP, thank you, thank you, thank you for your... Oh, I forget the members, uh, the people from St. Kitts and Nevis. 
and we also have a branch who? Oh? Booby Island, Timbuktu, Tatola in the house. Anyone else we forget? And we also have the Cancer Association in the house tonight. So thank you, thank you. And who else did I miss? Virgin Islands in the house. And who? Sugar City in the house. A young lady who is waiting to tear up the dance floor. So thank you, thank you. We have New York in the house. Mr. Hudson, right up there. New York is in the house also. So we want to offer our thank you to you. We couldn't have done it without you. And we'd like to see you again in all our other activities. And those of you who are here, remember, put this in your phone now on your calendar. Next, we have St. Vincent. What date is that? And we have Antigua and Barbuda. November 9th, and St. Vincent is coming up October 27th. So we need to put it in our phone and return the support to all of the sister island organization. Thank you. Most of all, give each and every one of you your own round of applause. You all are looking beautiful tonight. I love to do these functions because guess what? We all dress up in our dandans and we're looking gorgeous. Now, Okay, now we're going to have the introduction of our calm performer for tonight. And that will be given by Mr. Mr. Ward. I know this is one of the moments you guys have been waiting for. We're going to get you guys out. Up out of your seat now. Who remember? One for the road. We want one for the road. We want one for the road. Who? Anybody know who sing that song? One for the road. Slim Edwards. Well, he's in the house, and he's about to come here tonight. I am sure. If he didn't have that on the list, he's gonna play that one tonight. And yeah, that's the only song I remember from the seventies by Slim Edwards. <laughs> so. I present to you Mr. Slim Edwards. Thank you. How are y'all doing? Can somebody make some noise? I want you guys to come over here and pull up the dance floor, okay? Don't look at me. Get busy. Get busy. Let me hear from the here. Keep the vibes alive and keep this party going. Nice to see all these beautiful people out there. All the lovely ones over here. The beautiful people over here. All the St. Kitts peeps in the back, on the side. Come down, Glenbo. Hit them when you're ready. Hey, you remember this one? No, don't text and drive. It's really disgusting. Don't 